This is Gabby V, and welcome to the Clever Hybrids Podcast. Every season, we interview 12 bilingual professionals from around the world to hear their tips and to help you thrive in this multidimensional world. Let's jump right into the episode. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Clever Hybrids Podcast. You're probably wondering, what is season four, episode seven, doing at the end of the season? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, but the, the, the best for the final, you know? <laughs> well, then, well, let's see once we interview you, how good it is going to be. But <laughs> first of all, I have to apologize to you guys because Manuel had some excellent points in his episode, but I did not record it correctly, so the audio wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. So I was finally able to get in Manuel's schedule to be able to re-record it so you can hear his great points and not just read about them. No, don't worry. It's a pleasure uh, speaking with you and let's do it. All right. Well, let's jump mm-hmm. right in here. First of all, you were an expat from Venezuela living in Mexico. And most people think, oh, they both speak Spanish. But not only is the Spanish different, the culture is very different. So what are some things that you've noticed? Look, the, the thing with Latin America in general is that each country has particularities in the language. Most of the continents speak Spanish, you know, obviously, but the Mexican Spanish is a quite different in comparison with the Colombian or Venezuelan Spanish. The pronunciation, even because uh, Venezuelan, we, we speak very fast. The telenovelas around the continent are from Mexico. So we can understand Mexican easily. That's one thing. And the other thing, obviously, is the Mexican culture is so strong. It's so different in comparison with Venezuelan. Living in Mexico is a kind of adventure. One new thing uh, every day. Uh, so it's very interesting. Obviously, we in Venezuela, we have a great culture. In Mexico, we're trying to be great ambassadors. You know, our culture, our food, for example, we are proud of, of our arepas. The family is very important in Mexico, same with Venezuelans, no? So we, we have a lot of stuff in, in common. And I think the Mexican and Venezuelans, we can be friends easily, no? almost immediately. Well, you said Venezolanos speak very fast. And of course, you mm-hmm. have to think about slowing down. But mm-hmm. even in Mexico, you mentioned it last time, and I've been doing research since then. There are a lot of people whose primary language is not Spanish. Their primary language is Nahuatl or Maya or different yes. languages. Yes. Uh, in the south of the country, Spanish is the second language for most of the people, no? Uh, even in that situation, you have to speak Spanish more slowly, no? That kind of situation happens. And it, it, no, no, in Mexico, in Venezuela, for example, in Estado Zulia, in, in, um, uh, so this state is the capital is Maracaibo, the second largest city of the, of the country. And the north the, uh, of the city, there is a, a, there are the Guajiros. Guajiro is, is like a, a people that uh, speak a uh, old language, you know, uh, and the second language is Spanish. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know about that. But now that you're in the situation where you're the person who's not a native speaker, how do you you deal with that. I know as you already know to slow down for people, but when you need extra help in English, of course you speak very well already. How do you ask for it? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. When you are living in another country, if you have to learn about the Spanish in Mexico, for example, the recommendation is go to the street and speak with people different to you. Because uh, when you are in a close circle of people, you used to speak like them. When you want to learn something new, you have to go out of your comfort zone, go to another area, another zone. For example, Mexico City has more than 20 million people. Also, you had a lot of people to know, to, to speak to, and that's a way. I think it's the same in English. When you are speaking English with someone and you want to improve your skills, you have to go out of your comfort zone. That, that's the best way to enhance your, your skills in general. Yeah, it's very important, especially when you're an, an expat or an mm-hmm. immigrant. If you just hang out with all of the same people, you end up mm-hmm. getting stuck because mm-hmm. you're not growing. Mm-hmm. No, yes. And, uh, and the, the good thing in Mexico, for example, is the Mexicans are so open, no? And they are so nice. 
and they are willing to explain all the time. No, I try to say this. Yeah, okay, understand. Or maybe if they don't understand something, ask. No, what we trying to say. No, in, in nice way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So now with English, is there still an accent that's hard for you to understand? I know a lot of people say that some European accents are hard to understand. But which one do you have trouble with? Wow. That's a great question. But it was a kid. No, I always, obviously, uh, the impact in, in, in Latin America is the American English. The video games, the, the TV shows, the music, no? And most of that content comes from, from the US. So you used to the American English. But for example, the British accent was the first that I was struggled with. And when I was working on Circle, the Circle K, you know, community stores, and my boss was from California. So uh, I understood. 100% of his English, but we had a meeting with the people, the Circle Gay Ireland, Circle Gay Norway, Circle Gay Hong Kong. And wow. Even my boss, like he's American, he say, well, the Scotland team is trying to say, I can't understand. It doesn't happen even for native uh, English speakers. So the thing is, don't worry about that. If you struggle with some accent, uh, ask the person that is speaking with you, please. Slow down a little bit, display me some expression. That's normal, no? In my experience, the English from Scotland for Ireland it is so hard to understand for me. Yeah, I can understand that too. And just like we were talking about the people in Southern Mexico, many of the people in Ireland, Scotland, not now, but in the past two or three generations, English was not their first language either. Yes, that, that's the reason. It's the same with the Spanish. Well, uh, I, I can imagine someone, uh, uh, an English native speaker, and um, this guy is trying to, to learn Spanish. It's a mess. In Mexico, talking about someone, you say that way, <laughs> the, like that guy. But when you are uh, in Spain, you say uh, that tío, no? Tío is uncle. It's not the, only the pronunciation, it's the words, the expressions, the same in English, no? So in, the, in this process of globalization, I think that the people is more relaxed about that. If you understand, maybe you can struggle with my accent because I'm from Venezuela. Maybe my English is not perfect in comparison with a native speaker. But the people is open to understand that difference and focus on the communication, the most important part. Yeah, that's true. I know I, I have to... Be patient when I'm talking in Spanish, because since I'm not a native Spanish speaker, my Spanish is all mixed up. Like a, one minute I'll be like, vale, okay. And then the next minute I'll be like, what about I'll be like, what are, where are you from? <laughs> what is going on? So yes. then the, the same thing can happen with English. Like you said, it's hard to have a dialect if you're learning it mm -hmm. as a second language. So. Just go with the flow. If you say something and you're like, oh, that's British English with American English. They understood you. Move on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it is, it, yeah. Maybe the, the best advice on that situation is relaxed. Okay. No worry. Okay. The, the people in front of you is trying to understand what you say. If they don't understand, understand something, they will ask, be brave and speak and listen. All right. Well, this episode is a little bit. Opposite from most of our episodes, usually we go into the guest expertise and then jump into the language part. In your previous blog post, in our last discussion, how product development can be as short as three months mm -hmm. or as long as two mm -hmm. years. So what are mm -hmm. the factors behind the length of time it takes? Depends on the stage of the product. For example, if you're trying to develop a, a product from scratch, maybe days one year, because you have to understand first the, the customer journey, the lessons are focused on their target. You have to define the target of your product. And maybe you are launching a shampoo. You say, okay, my shampoo is for women from 20 to 30 years old, middle class. That's it. That's a target. But in that group of age and social class, there are a lot of behaviors behind. No women use the, the shampoo in the same way. Maybe you wash your hair twice a week or every day. So uh, you have to understand that. And that's why someone came up with the buyer persona. What's the buyer persona? Buyer persona is, is the, the, the description of one profile. I will say, okay, this is Gabby and Gabby have uh, the black hair, no? 
and she washed uh, her hair every day in the morning with cold water. And uh, she wants to try different brands each time that she goes to the supermarket. Okay, great. That's a buyer persona. That's more related to desires, to motivations, to behavior of each person. It's not only the target. And when you, you have different profiles, different buyer persons, you define the customer journey. And the customer journey is the entire experience a customer has while communicating with a brand. It's the complete interaction roadmap from brand discovery to purchasing and beyond. What does it mean? For example, uh, you're thirsty and you have plenty of options. You have water, you have energy drink, you have coke, you have a juice. So what happens when you want to take the decision? What do you want? So you have to understand that. What's the motivation of one person to, to go from the thirsty moment to a store and take the coke? Well, that's a journey. I will lay a, a coke. Okay. You took the decision. Next step. I, I have to go to a store. Which store? Okay. Convenience store, supermarket, bakery, restaurant. We have a lot of options. Okay. I went to the convenience store. Uh -huh. Where is the, the coke? I want a, a, a cold coke or a warm cold coke. In Mexico, some people want the, the, the warm coke. It's cultural. You have to understand that. These are uh, like many steps, no? To reach the coke finally. It's a bottle with a can. It's different experience. Understand the process doesn't take one week. That has a lot of time behind because you have to understand the customer's journey for each buyer persona. The brands that understood that are successful. You have to take at least six months to understand that. And after that, is, you go to the development part. And the development part depends on uh, vendors or providers. You have uh, the raw material, the packaging. How will you produce the product? Uh, will you produce, produce it for yourself? Or you have a contract with another company that produces for you the product? Or maybe you will import existing product to your country. So if you are launching a product from zero, you have to take into account all this stuff. And that maybe takes one year, two years. But maybe you have a finished product, a cell phone like this, because you say, okay, I would like to develop uh, a new cover for the phone. Okay, that's easy. I have the measures, I have the material, everything. I only change the label, the design, print it, and let's go. That's it. That takes three months. So then all of the development takes a while. In between, there can be some lag if it takes a while for the managers to make a decision. So how can you make the approval process faster? Avoiding the bureaucracy. <laughs> Look, one of the things, the challenge that the company has right now in the world is avoid bureaucracy. Have a process, maybe you have a, a, a system, an automatic system, the cloud, for example, you, you can share the files, okay? Each person take the responsibility to approve each part of the check. And the final checklist will be done for the mayor. Digitalize all the process. And that will be faster, no, easier. Because if you don't like something, you can do the comment online. Okay, I don't like this label, I don't like this color, but man, boom. But it's not the same that, okay, I have to call the person, explain, that, you know, come on. No, we don't have time for that. It's, it's better to do it online. In my experience, that's the best way to do it. The only thing that you have to do it physically is when you have the, the, the final product, because you have to touch it and try it. No, you can't. Avoid that. It's part of his responsibility. Before that, you have the opportunity to digitalize all the process. Mm -hmm. That's true. Even we think about Steve Jobs, he has that reputation of being like a control freak. After a while, he said, you know what? My job is to hire people smarter than me and then let them do their thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a way. That is way no? uh, sometimes the owner of the company thinks that he's right all the time. No, <laughs> not necessarily because there are experts in each field. You have to respect each field. And so for that reason, I, I, I love that mindset. You have to be around smarter people than you. So you, like an owner of the company, you can be calm, quiet. You can go for vacation because you will have a great people doing a great job for you. That's the best way. Yeah, interesting. 
uh, there's another word that I've been hearing thrown around a lot in marketing. And I think people are starting to forget what it actually means. Could you explain what in the world is omni-channel marketing? Wow, omni-channel. The people get confused with multi-channel. It's different, okay? Why? Let's think about the shampoo. What's the main sales channel of shampoo? You go to the customer journey and you find out that it's the supermarket. So, okay, if I want to, to launch a shampoo, I have to do it in the supermarket, okay? Great. Okay, that's, that, that's the first premise. But when you go deeper, you can find that the people is getting more digital and they are more willing to buy the shampoo and e-commerce. Ah, okay. So I must have a great landing page, a great system to maybe someone that wants to buy the shampoo online. Okay, great. Oh, well, but some people has a large family and they go to a price club, Costco or Macro in Holland or Sam's Club in US and Mexico. And you say, okay, there's a wholesaler and I can buy the big shampoo for all my family. But okay, that's enough. No, maybe someone go for vacation and they forgot the shampoo and they need the special package to get in the plane. So that's another challenge. How many channels I mentioned? Five? That's the multi-channel. Okay. You have a lot of channels to say the product, but what is only channel? The only channel is where you replicate the same communication message and you connect all the channels. How can you do that? You can have the shampoo with a QR code in the supermarket and you say, okay, ah, this is the shampoo. When you read the QR, you say, okay, if you want a shampoo online, I can give you 20% of discount. Oh, wow. That's a connection. Or maybe you say, if you buy the shampoo in Walmart, I can give you a discount the next time that you do it online or in a specific convenience store. So everything is connected. And you speak in the same message, the same color, the same art, every day, the same. And one of the best demonstrations of that is Coca-Cola. The, the image of Coca-Cola is the same. No matter if it's a supermarket, it's a convenience store, a tiny store, online, all the time is the same. You recognize the colors, the font, everything. When you have a multi-channel strategy, each channel has a strategy but there are no communication between them. So that is uh, the difference between multi-channel and omni-channel. You maintain the image, maintain the communication, but each channel has their own particularities. For example, if you are using signage for a convenience store, it's different in comparison with a supermarket, it's different in comparison with uh, e-commerce. When you are in e-commerce, you have time to explain to people with a video or with a, a great website. But when you are a supermarket, you don't have time for that. If you want to do something in the supermarket with a video, you have to have a QR code. You can read with the phone. Okay. Go to the website and you can watch the video. That's on the channel right? because you are connecting all the channels. So that's the way to go from the multi-channel platform to an own channel platform. Okay, I'll have to work on implementing that. Well, now there's a lot of nearshoring going on with the U.S. and Canada hiring Latinos that are bilingual. How would someone get into that particular field? Well, that's, that's a challenge, but it's not impossible, no? Uh, in this globalization process, it's more important than the skills and the experience you have that the origin or the you are come from companies are willing to hire someone from another country with another experience, with different way of thinking, uh, maybe there are different spheres of life that bring something different to this market. So in the U.S. and Canada, obviously you have to speak English, you know, that's mandatory. Highlight what do you do different in comparison with the people that is living there? Let's imagine that you are um, a guy working in finance, banking. And you are looking for a new job in the U.S. And you come from Venezuela, for example. What's the differentiation that you have between an American or Canadian banker or, or finance guy with you? And you say, okay, I used to work with inflation on 1 million percent per year. 
So we have to anticipate scenarios, financial scenarios to, to do everything in the bank. You have inflation in the U.S. of 2%. For me, it's a cake. Because <laughs> Yeah, no, no, so that, that's the way to, to explain to the people that you come from a, a hard environment and a harder situation, and you can apply that knowledge, that experience in a new market. You are from a, a different situation, and that's an advantage. The company that give value to that explanation is convenient for you. Hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I have not thought about it that way well either. But mm -hmm. Manuel, we want to thank you so much again for doing this with us a second time. I know okay. it was not easy for us to set this up, but I'm glad we did. So how can people get in touch with you at this interview? The best way to do it is in LinkedIn. Okay. You can write a Manuel Garcia marketing and I will appear in the list. You got marketing okay. locked down as SEO. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for the invitation and for me it's an honor to be speaking with you two times, three times, four times, no matter. All right, well, well definitely when we have an all-star episode, we'll have to bring you back in. Yes, it would be a pleasure. Still want more? First, subscribe or follow the Clever Hybrids podcast wherever you're listening to this and you can binge listen to our 30 plus episodes. If you want help to create a podcast or content for your business, check out our website, cleverhybrids.com. And as always, welcome to the Clever Hybrids tribe. This is Gabby V signing off. See you next time.